Don't believe or disbelieve anything we discuss in Spirit Signs. Simply have your own experience. Better get some popcorn ready. This one's gonna be pretty long. Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s time period, there was a social movement liberating the modern world from the reign of control that religion and superstition had on the people. Essentially, after our darkest part on the procession of the equinox, we were really beginning to wake up. Started making new inventions that were rapidly changing the world. The industrial era was beginning. Because of this, we began to see that maybe religion as an answer was not in our best interest, and so the movement happened. We turned to science instead to answer our questions about the universe. The only problem with this was that we grouped in many things with superstition that we probably shouldn't have. Things like consciousness, intuition, human connection, paranormal phenomenon, all of it went right out of the door with superstition, when in fact we've proven these things today to be real. So after 200 years of just going with the same idea about what's classified as superstition and what's okay to talk about, mainstream science is still going with the assumption that consciousness is just a part of the brain. They don't know how it works, they don't have a single rational explanation for it, but they keep on believing it. Why? Well, when we tossed superstition out of the door, even talking about it became taboo. It's just not done. Literally, the reason that it's tough talking about this stuff in the mainstream scientific community is because that's just the way science has been for 200 years. They won't have any of it, even though there are scientific institutions that prove that theory wrong. The field of noetics and the works of biologist Rupert Sheldrake and his colleagues have more than proven mass consciousness exists and is definitely not a part of the brain. Now, no disrespect to the scientific community, but that assumption that we're still holding onto has not gotten us anywhere. It's time we begin to question the decisions of our ancestors because many of the things that we've been led to believe to be true simply is not. I'm not saying blindly accept all of the new stuff that's coming out nowadays, but we should at least put it on the table and be able to discuss it as a global community. One other thing before we get this rolling, I want to give an overview about what sacred geometry really is. Sacred geometry is the geometry of consciousness. It revolves around the idea that all consciousness, including human, is solely based on sacred geometry. Because it is, we can begin to see and understand where we have come from, where we are now, and where we're going. The universe is infinite. It has no beginning and no end. In both science and religion, creation is often discussed from a perspective of having a set or a specific beginning. In science, we call it the Big Bang. This is the theory that says everything in the universe was compressed to the point of a single, infinitesimally small particle. Something we would perceive as unity, and then rapidly exploded and expanded outwards and created everything in the universe. In religion, it is generally called creation when God, or some all-knowing and all-seeing entity, being the only one imbued with such power, created everything, presumably in six days, before taking a well-deserved day off. Let's take a step outside the box for a second and put these two sides of this cosmic coin into a Vesca Pisces. As usual, the two enemies that never got along actually have quite a lot in common. Both say that the universe started with unity and expanded outwards. Both say that light was an important factor in creation as well. If at the beginning of the universe we were one essence and somehow became everything, then both are saying the same thing, that we came from the same source. But wait a second, how can we make sense out of that statement, the universe is infinite, if we are measuring it from a sense of having a beginning? And this is what we're going to talk about now. If we value the pursuit of knowledge, we must be free to follow wherever that search may lead us. The free mind is not a barking dog to be tethered on a 10 foot chain. Today, I wanna to talk about two specific energies that can be expressed through this image. The energy that flows here is male and female energy. Male energy is focused and female energy is creative and random. Neither of them is greater nor weaker than the other and both can be extremely powerful when fully manifested. Female energy is the land of unbridled possibilities, creative potential and affecting the universe from within. Focused male energy takes direct roads from point A to point B. This energy can be as strong as a tank, accomplishing tasks and going where it needs to go with precision and without distraction. The important thing to know about this energy is in how they move. I'm going to use some super basic sacred geometry to demonstrate this. This is the Fibonacci spiral. We're gonna be talking a lot more about it when we dive into the topic. For now, all you have to know is that it starts at one and flows outward forever in a very specific way and is present in all life everywhere. As male energy flows through the spiral, it goes from base point to point, from here to here, to here to here. It doesn't curve, it just goes straight where it needs to be. Female energy, however, would flow in the actual spiral. It would go around, going in and around outside all of the lines, but still getting to the same or similar results. 
This is the graphic representation of how it flows, but it also acts in the same way. From this understanding, you can see how we use these energies in our lives. It's the difference between driving straight to work and being on schedule all the time, and taking the scenic route because it's a more pleasant ride, even if it means being late. It's baking a cake strictly by what it says in the cookbook and putting it together with what just feels right. It's getting that promotion for working the hardest and getting that promotion for coming up with the best ideas. Here's a relatable example. It's the difference between Inception and Sucker Punch. Both about dreams, but one of them being the masculine story of professional men just doing their no-nonsense work, trying to get the job done, and the other being the feminine story that was creative and random and, according to many, didn't make much sense. Both male and female energy, like the chakras, have their own traits. Male energy is linear, analytical, strategic, and practical. However, when male energy is constricted, it is very blundering and confrontational, and what tends to occur is not seeing all sides of a situation, or not being open to any other possibility other than the one being pursued. You can see a lot of that in today's society. Most commonly, we call it being closed-minded. Female energy, on the other hand, moves in curves. It does not stay inside the lines. It is creativity and movement and expression and emotion. It can do anything and go anywhere, but it has trouble sticking to schedule. If constricted, it can get out of its flow, running rampant between emotions and mood swings and ideas. The creativity could get jumbled and come out as an out of control mess. We don't have this widespread issue in today's society, and it has a lot to do with our brain hemispheres. We're gonna look at that in a moment. One big difference between the two is that male energy looks at parts and female energy looks at holes. Before I go on, I wanna make this clear. Male and female energy has very little to do with sexual orientation. Like it's in the mix, but it's not a fundamental part of the energy itself. For example, if you look at the shape of male and female bodies, men have straighter bodies, women have curvier bodies. We'll probably come back to this in the lesson down the road. Okay, brain hemispheres, we have two of them. And if you remember what you learned in grade 10 biology, this will be familiar. The left brain is the male energy side of the brain. It is orderly, statistical, logical, and mathematical. It sees things in straight lines, rational and practical. The right brain is the female energy side of the brain. It is our creative side, a free spirit. It is passion and experience of taste and feeling, movement and art. As is the same with the energy, the left brain cannot make sense out of the right brain. You cannot put feelings and expressions within boxes. They must be felt to be truly experienced. The right brain too cannot make sense about how the left brain understands things. Okay, so as a species, we are primarily left-brained. Well, incredibly left-brained. This basically means that as a species, we essentially have a male energy imbalance. There is way too much of it. It is dominant and is constricting on the female side of the brain. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's kind of a blessing in disguise, but we have to talk about some other things first. Everything in the universe is geometric, whether it's people, trees, cats, planets, solar systems, stars, you name it. Anything in the universe can be measured on a geometric scale. Having said that, it's important to note that creation is also geometric. What we're going to be looking at today is the pattern of creation. Essentially, what this means is that everything in the universe comes out of this single pattern. I'm not making this up. This single image will change everything. When I mentioned in Lesson 5 that the ancient Egyptians and even more ancient civilizations knew about a deeper, basic understanding of the universe, this is the flower of life. And it is also the creation pattern of everything in existence. Even non-tangible things, emotions, thoughts, music in its entire spectrum, everything comes from this image. Okay, so there are 13 information systems that comes out of the flower of life. Today, I'm going to show you how physical reality can manifest itself, which is just one of the 13 systems. In future lessons, we will look at more. It's also important to note that at first it may not make sense. I ask that you do not choose immediately to shut this out and just watch with an open mind and try and see this in a new way. Also, I want to tell you that by learning about sacred geometry simply by observing, you are absorbing only a very minuscule amount of information. If you really want to learn more, you must begin to draw it yourself. I kid you not, when you do this, you begin to see things in a new way. You begin to understand why things are done in the way that they are done. Promise. The flower of life was known around the world in ancient times. It was found in Ireland, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, China, Greece, Germany, India, and Iceland. It's also been recorded to have been found in England, Tibet, Japan, Sweden, Lapland, the Yucatan, and I think 14 other places. This thing is everywhere. Not only that, but everywhere around the world it has the same name, the flower of life. Now, to understand the flower of life, first we have to talk about how it's formed. This could get incredibly complex, so I'll try and keep it simple. Imagine consciousness, or spirit, floating in a void which means it's nothingness, and then spirit. No physical body or mind, just spirit, and that's it. Then blackness, essentially nothing, all around the spirit, for infinite. Spirit decides to do something, so it expands its consciousness all around itself as far as it can go without moving. It creates a sphere around itself. This is the first circle in the flower of life. Then, spirit has an awareness of what's around itself in 360 degrees. It moves to the very edge of the sphere anywhere and repeats what it did the first time. It creates this image, which also creates the vesica Pisces, 
Within the Vesica Pisces is a vast and incredible amount of knowledge about width, proportion, depth. Also comes the square roots of two, three, and five, which are all numbers that go on forever. But even more interestingly, comes geometric information about light. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, spirit has no choice but to do it again. Spirit is flawless, and therefore it will move flawlessly, creating the next circle either here or here, exactly one radius away from the other circle next to it. Every time spirit moves another sphere, more and more knowledge comes out of the image that is created. The first complete image to be formed is this. It has two names, the seed of life or the Genesis pattern, and for good reason. Now let's look at the book of Genesis for a second. Each of these movements or creations of circles can be seen as another day. On the first movement, the second sphere, it created knowledge about not only mathematical proportions, but light. The first sentence of Genesis says, the earth was without form and void, and that the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the very next sentence, God says, let there be light. The key here is in the order. The movement happened first, then light happened immediately after. Well, but what about the waters? Well, you have to remember that the Bible has been changed over time a lot. The ancient Egyptians would say that the way our modern Bibles begin creation is impossible, especially if you think about it from a physics point of view. Imagine a dark, infinite space that goes on forever and ever in all directions. You're just floating there with nothing. You can't really fall, but where would you fall to? From a purely physics or mathematical point of view, motion itself, or kinetic energy, is absolutely impossible in a void. You can't even rotate, because motion cannot become real unless there is one other object in the space around you. So the ancient Egyptians would say that before God moved upon the face of the waters, it would first have to create something to move relative to. So, Genesis pattern. After three spheres, you get the Holy Trinity. Another interesting one, it says in many Bibles of the world, not just the Christian Bible, that on the fourth day of Genesis, exactly one half of creation was completed. Starting from the first motion, exactly one half of the circles were formed on the fourth day. Fifth day of Genesis, sixth circle, more information. And then on the sixth day, a geometric miracle takes place. The last circle forms a complete six petaled flower. This is what many earlier Bibles meant when they said, in the beginning, there were six. Our Bible even said creation was formed in six days, and this fits exactly. This is the pattern of Genesis, and so it's called the Genesis pattern. It's also the beginning of the creation of the universe that we live in. These original movements of spirit are really important, but now let's look at something even cooler. Another image that comes out of this pattern is this. It's called the Tree of Life. Many may recognize this as the Jewish or Hebrew Kabbalah, but the Kabbalah did not originate this image, and there is proof. The Tree of Life does not belong to any culture, not even the Egyptians who carved the Tree of Life on two sets of three pillars at Karnak Temple Luxor over 5,000 years ago. It's outside any race or religion, as with all of these images. There are patterns that are intimately connected with nature. You'll also notice that every circle on the Tree of Life is either the length or width of the Vesica Pisces. The second image beyond Genesis in the Flower of Life is the Egg of Life. This is formed during the second vortex motion. Upon its completion, it creates an image like this, a three-dimensional shape that you can hold in your hand. If you were to connect their centers, you would see a cube. So what, who cares? Well, the ancient Egyptians did because they were concerned with creation, life, and death. They called this cluster of spheres the egg of life. You probably won't believe me just yet, but this shape is the morphogenic structure that created your body. Your entire physical existence is dependent on the egg of life structure, and everything about you was created from that form. Everything from your eye color to how long your fingers are, this is a whole lesson on its own, so let's move on for now. All around the world, the flower of life was always made the exact same way. See, this pattern can clearly go on forever. However, they always, always stopped after 19 circles. Why? Well, because they didn't want you to see what I'm about to show you. Back then, this image and knowledge was so sacred that they couldn't allow it to become common knowledge. It was appropriate at that time. However, now we either use the information or fall further into darkness. In biology, all cells have a zona pellucida around the edge. These circles around the flower of life are the zona pellucida of the flower of life. You must remove these, then complete the spheres that were cut off by the zona pellucida. With one more step, you will have the secret. Finish the drawing, add the final missing circles, giving you this. This image is the fruit of life. This pattern of 13 circles is one of the holiest, most sacred forms in existence. It's called the fruit because it is the result, the fruit, from which the fabric of the details of the reality were created. Remember when we talked about male and female energy, lesson four? As you can see, this image is female. It has no straight lines. However, when you combine male lines with these female circles, something amazing happens. What you do is draw a straight line from the very center of every single circle to every other circle in this image. When you do this, you get an image which is known throughout the universe, everywhere, as Metatron's cube. It is one of the most important informational systems in the universe, one of the basic creation patterns in existence. So what is Metatron's cube? Well, anyone who has studied sacred geometry, or even regular geometry for that matter, knows that there are five unique shapes in the universe, and that they are crucial to understanding both regular and sacred geometry. They are called the platonic solids. 
A platonic solid has certain characteristics by definition. First of all, all of its faces are the same size. For example, a cube, the most well-known platonic solid, has a square on every face, so all of its faces are the same size. Secondly, the edges of the platonic solids are all the same length. All edges of the cube are the same length. Third, it only has one size of interior angles between the faces. In the case of the cube, this angle is 90 degrees. And fourth, when put inside of a sphere, all of the points will touch the edge of the sphere perfectly. With that definition, there are only four shapes besides the cube that fit that description. So what are they? Well, we have the dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the isosahedron, and the hexahedron. All of these shapes are found within Metatron's cube. This knowledge is also where original alchemy came from. The ancient alchemists and great souls like Pythagoras, father of Greece, considered each shape to have an elemental aspect to them. The tetrahedron was considered fire, the cube was earth, the octahedron was air, the isosahedron was water, and the dodecahedron was ether. Ether, also known as prana, and tachyon energy are all the same thing. They extend anywhere and are accessible at any point in space, time, and dimension. This is the great secret of zero-point technology. The sphere is voidness. These six elements are the building blocks of the universe, and they create the qualities of the universe. To summarize, this is the first informational system that comes out of the fruit of life through Metatron's cube. In alchemy, they rarely discussed ether. I've read that in the Pythagorean school, if you even uttered the word dodecahedron outside of the school, they would kill you on the spot. That's how sacred this shape was. 200 years later, when Plato was alive, he would discuss it, but only very carefully. This is because the dodecahedron is near the outer edge in your energy field, and is the highest form of consciousness. There's quite a bit more here, but I don't think I can go much further on it right now. Anyways, recognize this? The periodic table of elements? Every single element on this table has a geometric relation to one of these five shapes. Modern scholars ridiculed this idea until the 1980s, when Professor Robert Moon at the University of Chicago demonstrated that the entire periodic table of elements Literally everything in the physical world is based on these same five forms. In fact, throughout modern physics, chemistry, and biology, the sacred geometric patterns of creation are being rediscovered. Another example is the egg of life that I showed you earlier. Hopefully that will help you to understand just how incredible and important of a discovery this truly is. We have five platonic geometries that form everything in creation, but we don't have a hexagonal shape. If we look at the flower of life, we see that its ultimate basic form is in a six-pointed shape called a hexagon. Want to see where else hexagons form in life? We have all of these hexagons, and yet there is no platonic solid that is formed with a hexagon. So what gives? Well, I want to introduce the vector equilibrium, which was coined by Buckminster Fuller. It is actually formed from three two-dimensional hexagons that swivel around each other, and its basic shapes that make it up are an equilateral triangle and the square. These are the two smallest shapes that you can make with straight lines, and together they balance at each other's corners to create the perfect shape. Why is it the perfect shape? The reason is that every single line which is connected in this shape is the same distance away from every other point, including the very center of the shape itself. Not even the platonic solids have that definition, which also makes this the most stable shape and polyhedron, and the basis of the three-dimensional flower of life. Finally, the only reason it's not a platonic solid is because it has both squares and triangles within it. Platonic solids are platonic because each face is the same. Which makes me think that other shapes must exist that are balanced between two different shapes as well, and construct everything in the universe. Now, in the comments or end credits, depending on where you're watching this, I've posted links to a TED Talks video by Garrett Lisi, a particle physicist who tells us of an amazing discovery in the scientific field. I want to show you and talk about his findings, and then we'll look at dimensions after that. Okay, so Garrett has discovered that by examining coral, they found that each coral head has thousands of different polyps. These polyps are constantly budding and branching into genetically identical neighbors. Through performing heat experiments on these polyps, they were able to find that every single polyp is part of a whole, a single unit of being, but each one is experiencing its own reality individually. From their findings with the coral, they were able to look at quantum mechanics. See, the mathematics of quantum mechanics shows us exactly how our universe works, and we see that everything in the reality is just continually branching into new possibilities, just like the coral. 
As humans, we are individually experiencing only one of these possibilities, much like the individual polyps. What physics is telling us is that everything comes down to geometry and the interactions between elementary particles. Things can happen only when things are perfectly balanced. So Garrett starts showing us some subatomic particles and the things that make up electrons and protons and neutrons. We always consider these to be the smallest particle, but we never think about what's creating them. Garrett demonstrates to us how the particles that create point particles really work. He shows that when you plot them out in how they move, this is what they look like. At the tiniest scales of the universe in how it works is very beautiful. Now look at this. This is one of the ways that these charges branch off from each other. As you can see, it flows in a hexagonal pattern, the same pattern that we found in the expanded flower of life. Then, if you rotate this pattern in six dimensional charge space, you see it forms yet another pattern. Many of you will recognize this as the shape of the Star of David, but its true name is the Star Tetrahedron, which maps perfectly over the fruit of life. This entire pattern created by the particles is mapped across over precise places on a 200 dimensional spherical shape scientists have called E8, of which also has a geometric shape. By rotating that shape as well, you can see how there are nearly infinite possibilities as to how these elementary particles interact with each other. The details of the reality begin to take form. Now, as this shape is rotating in eight dimensions, you can see a myriad of different patterns here. Look at this one in particular. This looks a lot like Metatron's cube, doesn't it? At the heart of particle physics is pure, beautiful geometry. By now, you probably can begin to see where sacred geometry falls into this. Where do these shapes originate? Do they just come into being at random? Or does the first shape come from somewhere else? In lesson six, we talked about the flower of life, the original perfect geometric symmetry that created the universe. This shape, as we learned, is not only the root of all mathematical proportion, light, the platonic solids, but is also the source of every musical system in the universe, including systems both used and unknown to modern man. It is also the source of energy patterns and, well, everything. It all comes from the flower of life. I believe this is what is at the heart of what's forming every subatomic particle formation, and it probably goes at least a few levels deeper than what Garrett is showing us. Phi, also known as the golden ratio or golden mean, is a very simple relationship. If you had a rod and were going to put a mark on it, only two places would mark the phi ratio, which is here or here. The length of A plus B is equal to the length of C. This ratio is 1.6180339 and continues on forever. If you multiply the length of C with phi, it will create the exact same image, only bigger. C and D is equal to E. This ratio could then span on forever, going smaller and smaller or bigger and bigger forever. This ratio is infinite. It has no beginning and no end. It is also believed that phi is the mathematical root of all other sequences. See, every mathematical sequence in existence needs a minimum of three numbers to figure out the sequence. Phi only needs two. It is the only one. Similar to how the circle and square are the source of all shape, but we'll get to that later on. The next thing that you need to know is that this ratio is found in all life everywhere, sort of. By sort of, I mean it's really Fibonacci, but we'll look at that in a moment. Look at your hand. Not only does each finger have its own ratio moving up each finger, which is phi to the next bone, but it oscillates back and forth from the tallest finger to the thumb. You wonder why the human hand is like that? It's based on phi. This relationship is found throughout the body in various ways, moving up the arms and legs, in your face, throughout the entire body. This is a Greek statue that accurately represents this. The Greeks were very precise when they made their art because they understood phi, Fibonacci, and the importance of these sequences. When the Romans took over Greece, you could see the perfection in statues just completely disappear. I'm not saying the Romans were bad artists. They just didn't measure everything to the same caliber that the Greeks did. Here is the phi ratio in butterflies. You can see this ratio everywhere, from the wing size to the body to the antennas. They're all phi ratios. Here's dragonflies. It's the same story. Phi runs along the entire body and the relation to the body and the wings. Here it is in frogs. Phi is found throughout the body in relation to the head, to the arms, to the fingers, and so on. Well, what about fish? You'd think they wouldn't be found in fish. Well, here's three kinds of fish. Once again, the ratios are consistent. It doesn't just apply to these creatures though. Regardless of what mammal, insect, avian, plant, or living creature of any kind, you will find this ratio one way or another. There's a reason for this, but we'll get to that in a moment. Let me show you the importance we used to place on this golden ratio. In ancient times, we built many structures based on phi because we understood divine proportion. This is the pagoda of Yakushiji Temple in Japan. It's built with these same mathematics, from the doorway to the ball on top of the temple. It is a structural embodiment of the proportions that all life holds. The Parthenon in Greece also has the exact same mathematical structure, but even more. I recommend watching Nova's Secrets of the Parthenon if you wish to learn more about this, because the stuff that they find is really cool. The Great Pyramid in Giza also has these proportions. They're incredibly precise, perfect in every way. You'd think that by building these structures using the logical and mathematical proportions so carefully, that they would hinder the creativity behind these buildings, but they really don't. 
In fact, the left brain understanding all of this can even enhance creativity if used correctly. It makes me wonder about all of the world famous buildings of the modern world. Could Phi be a large factor in what makes them stand out? Let's move on to our next sequence, which is called Fibonacci. Now the Fibonacci sequence is life's way of creating the golden mean. Allow me to explain. This sequence is continually made from adding the previous number to the current. One and one is two. Two and one is three. Three and two is five. Five and three is eight. You can see how it continues. Now what most people don't know about Fibonacci is that it actually continually strives closer and closer to the phi ratio. By dividing the current number into the last, you can see this happening. One into one is one. Well, that's not close at all. Two into one is two. This time it's over phi, but closer. Three into two is 1.5, which is under, but closer still. Five into three is 1.666. This time it's over, but even closer. Continuing with that, it's 1.6, and then 1.625, 1.615384, 1 1.619048, and so on. It continually oscillates over and under the phi ratio, never quite making it there, but continuing on closer and closer every time, until eventually you can't even tell the difference. Because phi is an infinite number, this sequence will go on forever. Let's look at some spirals in nature, another way that phi and Fibonacci can manifest. This is a nautilus shell. Many people will say it's phi, but it's really Fibonacci. See how when it's in its earliest form, it's crude, not smooth or anything? One look and you can tell that's not phi. But as it goes out farther and farther, it gets closer and closer to phi. It becomes a nearly perfect phi spiral by the time it's all the way out here. This also happens with sunflowers, pine cones, and many plants in nature. In many cases, such as the pine cones and sunflowers, it flows in a double spiral or more, much like the spiraling arms of a galaxy. From the microcosm to the macrocosm, spirals are always present. So phi is basically source, or spirit, or god, in a mathematical way of thinking. <laughs> the math of god. Don't forget that this sequence is an intimate part of nature itself. I'm going to call it source. It is the source of all mathematical sequences, and all life in existence grows based on phi. However, phi has no beginning and no end. Life doesn't know how to deal with that. It's like source says, go and replicate this, and life says, we don't know how. Because life doesn't know how to create from something that has no beginning. So it creates the Fibonacci sequence instead, which has a beginning, but starts out crude, very basic, and then continually goes closer and closer to source, becoming more divine every step. It does take steps too, which actually has quite a bit to do with evolution. Let's move on for now though. The only other sequence you need to know for this is binary sequences. This is a sequence like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. We're just doubling the last number instead of adding it to the previous one. We're all very familiar with this. Binary sequences are found in life as well. For example, mitotic cell divisions are binary. We go from being a single cell being to having over 100 trillion cells in only 46 divisions. Binary sequences are also how computers work by turning on and off chips. Computing at its core anyways is binary. This is how a polar graph usually looks, with 36 radial lines in 10 degree increments, representing the 360 degrees. Then, concentric circles are drawn, each with the same distance away as the last, creating 8 equal demarcations as the one before, counting the inside circle as 1. Think about what this represents too. It's a two-dimensional drawing of a three-dimensional sphere, one of the sacred forms, by projecting it onto a flat surface. This is also called a shadow form, and casting shadows is a sacred way to obtain information. Also, a polar graph has both straight, male lines, and circular, female lines, both male and female energies interacting at once. If you plot a golden mean spiral at zero degrees on the polar graph, it will loop all the way around before hitting zero again, exactly at the eighth circle. You'll find that this golden mean line crosses five specific places as it goes out. These places are where the female circular lines meet the male lines. It crosses at 120 degrees, 190 degrees, 240 degrees, 280 degrees, and then it jumps to 360, or back at zero, depending on how you look at it. What's interesting about this is that it creates both a binary and Fibonacci sequence. Looking at the radial increments from the center, it crosses at 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. Well, that's Fibonacci, but it also crosses at 2, 4, and 8. Well, that's a binary sequence. We're going to look at the binary sequence in particular, though, because what you find is very cool. If you draw lines from the outermost circles on the lines where the binary sequence was formed, you get this image. It is an equilateral triangle. If you continue the spiral outward, it would continue to hit these exact same places and continue to form larger equilateral triangles. Let's divert yet again to look at something very interesting. There was a man named Keith Critchlow who discovered something very important to understanding the geometry of music. First, he drew a straight line through an equilateral triangle, and then he measured from the middle of the center line and drew a straight line up to the top edge and back down to the bottom corner. Then he did the same, but passed through the center line of the top and back down again. He did this yet again on the other side, you can keep doing this on either side as well. By drawing this funny little form, he discovered something of great importance. 
He writes, continuing in this way, each successive proportion will be the harmonic mean between the previous proportion and the total length, and all of these proportions will be musically significant. One over two being the octave, two over three being the fifth, four over five being the major third, eight over nine being the major tone or step, and 16 over 17 being the half tone or step. In other words, he discovered the geometries of music, or at least one aspect of them. Then he tried measuring it in a different way, starting at a different point of the center line. At three fourths, he found the measurements were one over seven, one over four, two over five, four over seven, eight over 11, and 16 over 19. All of these numbers are musically significant. This is very interesting. It means that the harmonics of music are somehow related to the proportions of the central line moving through a tetrahedron. Back to the polar graph, you can see that this drawing has a much greater value all of a sudden. Not only that, but it becomes even easier to make your measurements thanks to the polar graph itself. You can just draw a straight line through the drawing on the graph and it will give you the center line. This information has been taken light years beyond what I just showed you though. A research team found that you can draw these lines not only from the center, but from any nodal points inside the upper half of the triangle and you will come up with all known harmonics in existence. Basically, this means that anywhere the straight line and curve lines on the polar graph cross from zero to 120 degrees and start making the pattern, you will come up with all known harmonic systems, not only the Western keyboard, but the Eastern and even many unknown systems that have never been used. As I'm not a musician, there's not much more I can show you related to this, but I would love to see what a musician could really do with this knowledge. Remember when we talked about spirals in nature? They often travel in twos. Usually this is male and female. So on this polar graph, if you're going to copy nature, you don't just plot one spiral, you have to plot two. When you do that, it gives you this image, which is a star tetrahedron inside of a sphere. We mentioned this in lesson seven, and this image is more commonly known as the Star of David. Do you remember the face on Mars? NASA obviously tells us that it's just a random formation on the surface of the planet. But right next to the face, there are also a few pyramids and other anthropomorphic structures. I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would I bring that up all of a sudden? Well, Richard Hoagland and his colleagues have spent a long time researching and deciphering a message on the surface of the red planet. Want to know what that message was? It was a star tetrahedron inscribed in a sphere. Holy balls, right? It's pretty crazy and very eye-opening now that we have this information about what this really means. Inside the star tetrahedron, another one fits perfectly. We can continue to put more and more star tetrahedrons inside or outside of the other star tetrahedrons, the same way the golden mean spiral can wrap around the polar graph infinitely big or infinitely small. You'll notice that this smaller tetrahedron also happens to fit perfectly around this sphere. We'll check this out. If you put this same size sphere centered on the point of every single star tetrahedral point, guess what suddenly reveals itself? of life. It's back. According to the Egyptians, this is one of the holiest, most sacred forms in existence. Of course, we already learned one of its informational systems in lesson six, and what you just saw was the second, only in reverse order. What this means is that all of the information of music, harmonics, sound, and spirals come out of this image. Not only that, but light and the dimensional levels work in the same way as harmonics, which we've already discussed in lesson two, seven, and nine, meaning that the geometric information about light and dimensions are also related to this star tetrahedron pattern. So what you just saw was the second unraveling from the third rotational pattern of Genesis, the geometry at the heart of creation. Now we can start talking about dimensions. These wheels are some of the oldest symbols known. The only places that they've been found is on the ceilings of certain very old Egyptian tombs. They are always found in sets of four or eight, and nobody knows what they are. Even the most famous Egyptologists have no idea, but this is actually proof that the Egyptians not only understood the flower of life, but they lived it. Today, I'm going to show you what these wheels meant. And in future lessons, we will go over the details of this unraveling. There's a lot to cover before we get there though. For the record, the unraveling looks like this. Yeah, it's a doozy. So on the walls with these wheels are drawings of seven people with animal heads. They're called kneaders, and each of them has an orangish red oval above its head. This is called the egg of metamorphosis. The kneaders are showing us a time when we go through a certain stage of resurrection, which is a rapid biological change into a different life form. Not the average type of resurrection, I know. As you can see here, they're changing directions 90 degrees, and in doing so, they're changing dimensions. See, the dimensional levels are separated by 90 degrees. Musical notes are separated by 90 degrees. The chakras are also 90 degrees. It's a number that continually appears. Probably at this point, we should get a common understanding of what dimensions are, like third dimension, fourth dimension, fifth dimension. What are we talking about here? Most people think of dimension in terms of time and space, the X, Y, and Z axis, with time becoming the fourth dimension. This is not what we are talking about. What we're seeing as the various dimensional levels has more to do with music and harmonics than anything else. A piano has eight white keys from C to C, which is the familiar octave, and in between there are five black keys. 
Together, this creates what is called the chromatic scale, which is 13 notes, well, actually 12, with the 13th being the first in the next octave. So from one C to the next is really 13 steps, not eight. This also correlates with the seven, eight, and 13 chakra system I mentioned in lesson two. Keeping that in mind, I wanna show you a sine wave. Sine waves correspond with light and the electromagnetic spectrum and the vibration of sound. We're all very familiar with this. In this entire reality we're in, every single thing is based on sine waves. There are no exceptions to this, except for maybe spirit and void. Quantum physics and quantum mechanics looks at everything in the reality of one of two ways. You can look at anything, like the computer you're watching this video on, to be made up of tiny particles like atoms. Or you can forget about that idea completely and look at it as a vibration, a waveform, such as electromagnetic fields or even sound. If you look at it as atoms, the laws can be seen to fit that model. But if you look at it as waveforms, the laws can be seen to fit that model. Both of these systems come out of the flower of life, one being the one we just looked at, fruit of life to Metatron's cube and beyond, and the other being this beautiful mess of a picture. Just looking at it hurts my head. Everything in this world is a waveform or can be seen as sound. All things, your bodies, planets, absolutely everything are waveform. If you choose this particular way of looking at reality and then superimpose that view over the reality of the harmonics of music, we can begin to talk about dimensions. The dimensional levels are nothing but different base rate wavelengths. The only difference between this dimension and any other is the length of its basic waveform. It's just like a radio set. Turn the dial, you pick up a wavelength. It's the same with dimensions. If you were to change the wavelength of your consciousness and in doing so change all of your body patterns to a wavelength different from this universe, you would literally disappear out of this world and reappear in the one you were tuned in. It's been theorized that the base rate wavelength that we're currently living in is 7.23 centimeters. There's a few reasons for this. In a spiritual sense, the 7.23 wavelength is Om, the Hindu sound of the universe. Maybe that's why Oming is such a powerful tool in meditation. Not only that, but if you were to take 100 people and measure the distance between their eyes, the average length is 7.23. Same with the distance from the tip of our chins to the tip of our noses, and the distance across our palms and between our chakras. This 7.23 length is located throughout our bodies in various ways because we are emerged within this particular dimension. There's another reason as well. Bell Laboratories found this wavelength when they were setting up the microwave system around the United States. They found the static in their system because they chose a wavelength just slightly longer than 7.23 for their system. In order to get rid of the static, they did something that we as a planet are still suffering from. They upped the power 50,000 times over what we would normally need, which created a very powerful field, so that the 7.23 wavelength would not interfere. It's for those reasons that I believe 7.23 is the wavelength of our dimension. As you go up in dimensional levels, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter, with higher and higher energy. As you go down in levels, the wavelength gets longer and longer, with lower and lower energy, more and more dense. Just as with a piano, there's a space between the notes, so that when you hit one note, there's a very definite place where the next note is. In this waveform universe we exist in, there's a very definite place where the next dimensional level exists. It's specific wavelength relative to this one. Most cultures in the cosmos have a basic understanding of this and understand how to change between dimensions. However, because of certain events that happened on Earth 13,000 years ago, we have all forgotten, but we're about to remember. So if we show each note in the chromatic scale as a circle, we have 13 circles. Each circle represents a white or black key, and the shaded circle at the end would be the 13th note that begins the next octave. This circle here represents the third dimension. This is where we are, and this circle next to it would be the fourth. In lesson three, we talked about channeling, and this is typically where channeled beings are. This is also where you explore when you are astral projecting or lucid dreaming. You'll notice now that the musical system goes upwards and downwards forever, octaves over octaves over octaves. Theoretically, this is how the universe goes too, an infinite spectrum of universes in both directions going upwards and downwards forever. I mean, come on, we thought our universe was big, but everything in our universe, as far as we can see, well, that's just this one dimension. You may have heard people talk about 144 dimensions and how 144 relates to other spiritual subjects. This is because there are 12 notes in an octave and 12 overtones between each note. 12 times 12 equals 144 dimensional levels. To be specific, there are 12 major dimensions and 132 minor dimensions within each octave, though in truth, this progression probably goes on forever. The diagram we've been looking at represents one octave. The 13 note repeats, and then there's another octave after that. I wanna show you this. I was watching Ancient Aliens not long ago, and one of the natives who has communication with beings in higher dimensions told the man who was interviewing him that they have always been here, even right here where we're sitting right now, but you just don't see them. They're in a different frequency. And no one really got what he meant. So that's kind of a fresh perspective on that. An apocalypse is a disclosure of something hidden from the majority of mankind in an era dominated by falsehood and misconception. Today, we're going to be looking at another way that humans grow through phi. Instead of looking at phi inside the body, we're going to be looking at phi outside the body and what it means for us in this pivotal point in human history. Do you remember the fruit of life? The first system created the platonic solids, which created structure throughout the universe. 
The second system was the basis of how vibration, sound, harmonics, music, and matter are all interrelated in all of creation. Today we will look at the third system, the fruit of life will reveal itself in the process. We'll call this system the circles and squares of human consciousness. It is what the Chinese called circling the square and squaring the circle. Remember when we discussed the platonic solids in lesson six? I showed you that all of them will sit perfectly within a sphere, each with every corner touching the sphere perfectly. Well, there's one other shape that can do that. It's a characteristic that only one of the platonic solids have, making it special. It is the cube, which you can put every single platonic solid inside, and an edge or point will touch the inside of the cube perfectly. Through truncating the cube in different ways, you can create all of the other shapes. Because of this characteristic, it essentially means that the cube is like the father of all shapes. It is a male form, and the sphere is the mother of all shapes. It is a female form. All levels of consciousness in the universe are integrated by a single image in sacred geometry. It is the key to space, time, and dimension, as well as consciousness itself. Each level is a geometric image or lens that spirit looks through to see the one reality, resulting in a completely different experience. In the case of humans, this image is the circle and square. This is what Leonardo da Vinci was doing when he drew this drawing, and I'm going to show you what this circle and square combination mean. If you put a circle inside a square perfectly and then continue to put another circle and square, each with the same diameter, one radius away on all sides going outwards, you get a drawing that looks like this. You'll notice that with the first circle and square, they fit perfectly within the other. This also happens with the second circle and square. However, then the squares begin penetrating circles. The male form begins interacting with the female form. Why is this important? Well, the circles and squares begin to equate the phi ratio. See, when the circumference of a circle and the perimeter of the square are equal, this equates the phi ratio. So as you can see on this diagram, on the fourth square and the fifth circle, it begins to create the phi ratio. It's close, but not perfect. It's only a 0.6 difference. I'm measuring in radii, by the way. The inner circle has a radius of one, so it's two radii across. The next is four, and then six, eight, 10, and so on. So the one we just looked at makes a close phi ratio, and then it moves out of sync, staying out of sync for a bit, and then bam. Again, it moves into yet another phi ratio. This time, the difference is only 0.52, even closer to perfection than before. This will continue on forever. If you were to continue this drawing outwards to infinity, each time it would go into sync, drop out of sync for a few circles and squares, but then eventually hit phi again closer than it did the last time. Right now, there are three primary levels of consciousness that we are going to be talking about. They are essentially who we were, who we are, and who we will be. We'll call it the first, second, and third, so that it's easy to understand what we're talking about. The ancient Egyptians were very concerned with these three levels as well, and much of their culture was based on this information. Each of these levels has their own geometric lens too, which look like this. We'll come back to these soon. This is the first level of consciousness, and this is the third. We are on neither of these two phi levels on this circle and square chart. Where we are, the second level of consciousness, is here. We are on the fifth square relative to the sixth circle. For quite a while now, I've been saying that we're at a disharmonic level, and it's something that we're passing through as a species. Now you begin to see the bigger picture of what I meant. The reason it's disharmonic is because it does not equate a phi ratio, not even close. Disharmonic levels are important because they bridge a gap between the divine, pure levels. However, when a species is here, it has to get in and get out as fast as possible, or else they will destroy themselves and everything around them incredibly quickly. You can see this happening all around the world today, because we're at the very end of it, and everything is crashing down on us. We've discussed this all before, notably in the intros of Lesson 1 and 2. So, the reason that we're on this circle and square combination, and not the 6 square relative to some other circle, is because of this. If you take the square and rotate it 45 degrees, it actually creates a bridge. It connects us from two harmonic levels of being. We're moving from one state of being to the other, this time even closer to source. This is a very exciting time for us. Oh, let me show you this too. This is how the Great Pyramid is set up. This chamber here is called the King's Chamber. If you cut the Great Pyramid horizontally at the King's Chamber, which was the main initiation chamber, and rotate the top half 45 degrees, it makes the exact same image as our level of consciousness. There's a reason for that. The Great Pyramid is the key instrument in allowing humans to reach the third level of consciousness, both as a species and individually. In fact, that's part of the reason why the Great Pyramids were created in the first place. Let's talk more about these levels though. So what Leonardo was drawing was actually the first level of consciousness. See how he hid lines in this drawing? If you complete this grid, it creates an 8x8 grid. This is the same 64 square grid found on the first level. Measuring in radii, this grid is 8x8. However, the circle has 10 radii across, so we'll call this first level an 8x10. This is where we were. The first level is the first time self-aware consciousness began. The second level has 10 squares across the large square, and a 12 radii circle, so we'll call it a 10 by 12. This is where we are now. This level is the third level, which is also called Christ Consciousness. It is a 14 by 18. 
Now, there's always a reason for everything in sacred geometry. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens without a reason. Everything is connected. Out of the whole spectrum of possibilities, why did self-aware human consciousness begin when the fourth square went into harmony with the fifth circle? Well, let's overlay the fruit of life over our first level for a second. Look at that. It exactly fits the fourth square and fifth circle perfectly. Do you see the perfection of life? The fruit of life pattern was hidden beneath this pattern all along. They're precisely superimposed over the other. In a right brain way, this is how to explain why consciousness first became self-aware between the fourth square and fifth circle. This sacred image was part of the pattern. The fruit of life was completed at the precise moment that the phi ratio first appeared. And when phi appeared, consciousness had a way to manifest in a new way. Throughout time, many scholars have tried to figure out the secret meaning behind what Leonardo meant with the Vitruvian man drawing. He was showing us human consciousness. This is where we were, the first level. There is a man who did draw our level though. Da Vinci was studying the words of a man named Vitruvius who lived 1400 years before Da Vinci, hence the name Vitruvian man. Vitruvius actually drew his own drawing of consciousness as well. And this is what it looked like. The circle and squares in this one are hidden, less obvious than the Da Vinci drawing. Regardless, they're there. And this is the current circle and square combination around our bodies. This drawing also contains the exact proportions of the Merkaba, which is an important energy system outside of the body, similar to how chakras are an energy system inside the body. This image also contains the diamond that perfectly contains the man from head to feet. This is the same image we saw in the consciousness chart, as well as the Great Pyramid. Further proof that this was what Vitruvius was demonstrating to us when he created this image. So here we have drawings of the first two levels of consciousness. From what I know, there is no drawing of a third. If there is, it's sealed up, locked away somewhere, and is probably one of the most sacred drawings in existence. All right, I know talking about geometry all the time can be a little daunting. So many circles and ratios and everything. If this is something you want to learn more about, I am providing the Flower of Life books and PDFs in the comments. This information is found at the very beginning of volume two and much, much more. I could probably do four or five lessons about the geometries of the human body and still not run out of things to talk about, but it's there for you if you want to learn more now. For the last portion of today's lesson, we're going to talk about some recent findings in modern science. As we just saw in the geometry, we are currently in a disharmonic state of being, but we are just about done with it. In doing so, we are moving into a new state of being. We are transferring from the second level of consciousness to the third, also called Christ consciousness. If we look at evolution in Earth's history, we always seem to make random jumps. There are always missing links in the evolutionary chain. Scientists say that we just haven't found all the fossils, and creationists say that God did it, and therefore it's part of some divine plan. But looking at what we just learned about consciousness, does it not make sense that evolution and creationism are just two sides of the same coin? Consciousness moves through different states of being, constantly moving closer and closer to divinity, to phi. Every time it reaches a new stage, it makes a rapid biological change into something new, like what we're doing now. This is what the ancient Egyptians called resurrection, which we mentioned in lesson seven. So if we're really going through an evolution of consciousness, what's happening inside of us? Surely this would mean that there are also biological changes happening to us at our core level, right? Does modern science see any big changes that they're afraid to tell the general public because they think it will cause a panic? Short answer, yes. Long answer, we are changing. Scientists have been studying this for almost 10 to 20 years now. Several years ago in New Mexico, there was a convention of geneticists from all over the world with the main topic of discussion being DNA mutations. Scientists acknowledge that we are changing, but the end result, they do not know. Through sacred geometry, we begin to actually see where we could be going. With 12 strands activated, you have 10 times as much information available to you than you do with just two strands, as we do now. Not only that, but the 12 strands work in sync with the 12 chakras, providing an immense amount of energy into the body. We are about to become super beings, enabling us to understand and do things that currently seem paranormal, bizarre, or downright impossible. From the article, The Bigger Picture by Suzanne Thorpe Clark, we are being changed physically from carbon-based beings to crystalline-based beings. This is interesting because I've actually heard this from various channelings now, ascension and transformation into crystalline at our core. First, the psychics were telling us this, and now we have science backing it up. What we know for sure is that we are going through a shift. In almost every ancient text and Bible, it speaks about a great shift and awakening. The Bible speaks about the coming of Christ. This is interesting actually, because Christ is the name of the third level of consciousness. I didn't just make that up. We are moving into Christ consciousness, which means not that Jesus is going to show up with a big A, but we are actually moving into the level of conscious understanding that Jesus had. It is the coming of Christ through the human species. So higher strands of DNA, what does this really mean? 
The portions of the DNA chain that science has presently identified as the double helix represents only the surface portions of the chemical, elemental, and electrical components of the active DNA strands. Science has yet to understand the multidimensional spectra of DNA manifestation, though we are beginning to remember. The human DNA imprint will always appear from external analysis as a two-strand double helix configuration in three dimensions. What is not understood is that within the double helix there are, and will be progressively more, additional double helix strands which fuse together. As our understanding evolves into the multidimensional spectra, the understanding of the structure and function of DNA will progressively advance. A team of Russian researchers working with DNA started a project to progressively learn more about DNA by combining forces with linguists and have dived into the unknown of the 90% of junk DNA which we currently embody. Their findings are evolutionary. According to them, our DNA is not only responsible for the construction of our body, but is also used as data storage and in communication. They learned that the 90% of DNA follows the same rules as all of our human language. The way that sentences, paragraphs, and chapters work in a book is the same way that our DNA works. This is the first double helix strand, the one that Western science looks at, which is basically like a sentence of DNA. However, if you step back and see the bigger picture, you begin to see the paragraph, stepping back further and you see the chapter, and so on. These larger and larger strands span through the different frequencies of reality, the different dimensions, which makes them harder to find in our modern science. Western science, instead of looking at DNA like this, we're cutting out pieces of DNA from here and adding them over here, which is similar to picking out words in certain sentences and putting them with other words in other sentences to see if they fit together and can make a new energy, a new idea. This is the nature of our junk DNA, of which Western science just didn't understand for the longest of times. The DNA isn't junk, it's just misunderstood and also not as used right now because of our dense level of consciousness. However, we are beginning to activate and reawaken our DNA through our ever-expanding consciousness and our desire to know more. The very awareness of this DNA is what is activating it, awareness of our higher selves and our connection to the all and the interconnectedness to each other. We are directly connected to the earth as well and exist as a part of it, kind of like a child in its mother's womb. If anything happens to the mother, it creates an energetic imprint that affects the child. The earth is our mother, hence the name Mother Earth. Our morphogenic field exists as a part of her larger morphogenic field of the Earth. If something happens to the Earth's energetic grid, then we inherit these problems into our own grid. Our energetic anatomy is exactly like the Earth's, with chakras, meridians, axiotonal lines, and DNA. If something happens to the planet's grid, then that affects every person's DNA on the planet. We are at a very important point in history right now, because we are remembering how to regenerate our original organic imprint for health. We don't even need science and fancy equipment to do this. We're just required to learn how to use what we came here with. By moving into a space of love and light, opening and living from the heart and living in a place of emotional stability and health, you can once again reactivate your light body and in doing so, reconnect with the higher frequencies of your being. Energetic blockages will reveal themselves as problems in your own life. Depression, anxiety, temper rages, or personal problems in your life, which are causing stuckness or driving you down a path of chaos or disruption are also energetic blockages. The Institute of HeartMath has shown that generating sustained positive emotions facilitates a body-wide shift to a specific scientifically measurable state called psychophysiological coherence. Let's break this down. Psycho comes from psychological, which means mental and emotions, and physiological means body. Coherence is systematic or logical connection or harmony. Altogether, it means a harmony of both body, mind, and emotional functions. If you're familiar with the four elements, you know that earth is the physical, so body, air is mental, mind, water is emotions, and fire is spirit. HeartMath has scientifically shown now that positive and healthy emotions bring three of those elements into coherence. And although they don't look at the spiritual aspect, I don't doubt that the fire element also comes into harmony. In an experiment done at the Institute, they hooked up scanners to an individual who was subjected to very chaotic emotions. For 300 seconds, they measured the respiration, heart rate variability, and blood pressure rhythm. After this time, the individual on the scanners did a technique on himself which they have dubbed the HeartMath Quick Coherence Technique, which activated a feeling of love and appreciation. Instantly, all three of the rhythms came into entrainment and harmony with each other, and stayed in harmony for the remainder of the experiment. One important note to stress is that cohesion is not relaxation. The process of relaxation is a low energy state in which the individual rests both body and mind. 
typically disengaging from cognitive and emotional processes. In contrast, coherence is experienced as a calm and balanced, yet energized and responsive state of being that is optimal for mental acuity, focus, problem solving, and decision making, as well as the physical activity and coordination. So coherence is the natural state you want to be in all the time. You know, un unless you're relaxing, you know, that's, that's good too. <laughs> so how does one get into the state of cohesion? Breathing. Your breath is intimately connected to your heart rate and your heart in general. And if you ever find yourself in a very chaotic mental state, take a few seconds to step back of what's causing the chaos and focus on your breath. Take long and deep breaths. The Institute of Heart Math doesn't put too much focus into particular breathing techniques, but they put an emphasis on using your breath as well as positive and loving emotions to bring you back into a state of cohesion. They say that it's not super necessary to put focus on your breath all the time, but it is very helpful to bring yourself out of chaos and back into alignment. From a spiritual perspective, and if you're working towards that, breath is very important. However, breath is another huge topic, and I personally recommend focusing on your breath during meditations. Focusing on breathing and your heart is a beautiful way to move into a silent space during meditation and deeper into yourself, all while sustaining the same healthy emotions. Now, throughout ancient history, across many, many religions and belief systems, the heart was always considered a center of the being, the source of spiritual wisdom and insight, thought, emotion, and connection to the divine. The ancient Egyptians believed that all thought and life was done from the heart, which is why they threw away the brain after the pharaoh died, but they left the heart in the body. They felt that the being would need it in the next life, so they left it there, but the brain was useless. Western scientific thought places the heart as just a pump. However, in the last several decades, science has begun to go full circle in realizing and understanding what these ancient civilizations knew and taught. In the field of neurocardiology, scientists have discovered that the heart possesses its own intrinsic nervous system, a network of brain cells with over 40,000 neurons. This gives the heart the ability to independently sense and process information and make decisions, even demonstrate a type of learning and memory. In a simplified sense, you can think with your heart. The heart is truly an intelligent system. The heart also has found to be a hormone gland, manufacturing and secreting numerous hormones and neurotransmitters that profoundly affect the brain and body function. Among these hormones is one called oxytocin, well known as the love or bonding hormone, bringing things together. Science is also beginning to understand that the electromagnetic field around the heart has a powerful effect on not just the human body, but others around you as well. Research has also shown that the heart is the key component of the emotional system. Science now understands that the heart not only responds to emotions, but the signals it sends out dramatically affects the quality of the emotional experience from moment to moment. And also that our heart plays a key role in accessing our intuition. In school, we've been taught that the heart is constantly responding to orders sent from the brain. But what's less commonly talked about is that the brain receives even more orders from the heart. We've been doing it backwards. Moreover, these signals have a significant effect on brain function influencing emotional processes as well as higher cognitive faculties such as attention, perception, memory, and problem solving. Guide yourself from your heart, not from your brain. When you allow your negative emotions to get to you, you disconnect from your ability to think clearly, remember things, learn lessons, reason, and make effective decisions. Which explains why often we act impulsively and unwisely under stress. The heart's signal has a profound effect on the brain during positive and negative emotions. Live in your heart, for the heart is the center of unity consciousness, where the brain is the center of duality consciousness. You can see that right in how they're made. The brain has the two hemispheres. The heart is a place of unity. Since we fell in consciousness, we moved from heart consciousness and into our brains, and all decisions were made from the brain. In doing so, we became polarized and lost our connections to the universal consciousness called unity. This shift in consciousness we are experiencing now is a movement from the brain and back into the heart where we will once again know and understand the universe and unconditional love for everyone and all things, regardless of who they are or what damage they've done to themselves or others. And this is why the heart is so important right now. Live in your heart. It is the gateway to the divine. The Taurus is a very fundamental part of nature. So fundamental, in fact, that science is now seeing that everything moves through this form in one way or another, including ourselves. Very simply, the Taurus is a self-organizing system that all comes together at a space of unity and expands its energy out all around itself until it returns back to that original space of the center and will continue to do it again. In quantum physics, mathematics, and generally all forms of science, 
this geometry really begins to bridge the gap between understanding how sacred geometry truly is the geometry of life. This is a geometry that breathes. It has life itself. Our very own hearts are the first and best examples of a toroid. The heart is where it all starts. The energy of our hearts flow outward in a toroidal fashion and are also received in a toroidal fashion. This way, everything we send out in love, we are immediately affected by as a result. In other words, our emanation of love is a gift to yourself as much as is a gift to the universe around you. You can look in nature to see these shapes everywhere. It's in oranges and apples. You can see it around tornadoes. The magnetic field of the Earth is a very powerful example, as well as how the atmosphere of the planet works too. Our modern scientists haven't really taken the concept of hollow Earth very seriously, even though this concept does explain a lot of fundamental theories about the Earth to which we don't really understand, despite all of our theories. Well, the idea of hollow Earth works in the exact same way as well. It demonstrates that our planet is designed from the core as a torus. The Earth is multidimensional, so we can actually have both a hot iron core as well as a 5D hollow Earth interior as well. For those who want to learn more immediately, check out Hollow Earth HD on YouTube. Moving on, we all know the fundamental principle of the universe of as above, so below. Well, this torus is even found at the size of galaxies. Atoms even have this very geometry as well. It's quite literally everywhere. From this basic expression demonstrates how life ought to be. All of the energy that emerges from the core travels around the torus and fuels itself. It also has the ability to give to other toroidal systems, which openly practice giving and receiving. It really sets a standard for how to do things, and we can mirror this and use it in our own daily lives as well. When you give and receive openly, you allow your energy to become toroidal. When we look at the interactions between one another, we begin to see the nature of giving and receiving. If we shift how we give and receive with others, we give ourselves an opportunity to receive feedback from what we emanate immediately. This allows for an enlightening transaction of energy between all life and allows all of our communications to resonate on that toroidal frequency of love. Love is not just a feeling, it's a vibration and a frequency that is connected through all things. The pure vibration that emanates around one's own heart and brings things together harmoniously is through a universal vibration we call love. If you look at the flower of life in 2D, it may be a little hard to tell. However, in three dimensions, one can truly see that it too is a torus. The flower of life is all geometries, remember? The torus is yet another one of those creation patterns that emerge from this, or rather is this form. It's so important to understanding everything. Even Nikola Tesla worked with this geometry and through it, he discovered a way to access free energy for the entire planet. Well, of course, all of the corporations of the world wanted to keep charging people for energy. And between them and the US government, all of Tesla's most amazing work was destroyed. In lesson 15, we talked a bit about this before, and now we can go deeper into it. The Institute of Heart Math, as well as Stanford University, among others, have now scientifically demonstrated that around the physical heart of your body, you have two toroidal fields, one inside the other, which are connected to the sacred space and the tiny space within the heart. Greg Braden has done a lot of work in explaining this to the modern world as well, and Drunvalo Melchizedek has put a lot of focus into teaching that this is some of the most important information regarding physical ascension. This is part of the understanding that is truly bridging the gaps between science and spirituality. China is doing some really amazing things. They have hospitals that are completely dedicated to the work of prana and energy, rather than the physical body of patients. In one experiment in a Chinese hospital, we see how the science of mantra is used to remove the cancer tumor of a woman in just two and a half minutes. A mantra is a sacred sound or chant that acts as an energetic formula for prayer or meditation. Mantras allow for us to connect to our source and emanate an audible frequency that focuses our mind to the sound and thus inwardly back to the source. When chanting from the heart, these doctors allowed themselves to focus on the reality that this woman was already being healed. In this, it allowed for the mind to bypass the normal confines of reality, as its intention toroidally flowed in and out of the source of which reality emanates itself. For everyone who has been skeptical of the idea of self-healing through intention, this video is proof that it's not just a plausible idea, but it's very, very real. We need only understand why it works and how it works. To come from a skeptical place and try, you will only see skeptical results. To come from a pure and true space, anything is possible.
Nassim Haramine has made a documentary recently called Black Hole, which we did discuss in Lesson 18. He has demonstrated that the space at the center of the torus is literally the point of singularity, infinity, and the space where all consciousness truly resides, the source of the source field, and a space where all things are connected. In our modern physics, we don't really take consciousness and life into the scientific equations. Russian scientists are propelling their understandings of life to new levels and have even begun bridging the gaps of understanding gravity. Our Western model is not built to understand gravity and the Russians have developed models which harmonically see that gravity itself is a conscious field, an information field of love that holds things together. It's really profound and even quantum physics is beginning to look at this in new light. Remember in lesson 18, we talked about the vector equilibrium. This torus form and the cube octahedron go hand in hand. It is the male and female aspects of each other and the vector equilibrium when put into use in science can grant access to an infinite amount of energy through tapping into the space of unity of the source field, the zero point, the field of consciousness that science now knows connects all things. By understanding the torus and the nature of unity, one can really get in tune with themselves in relationship to the all. Let's also remember that considering our universe itself and everything within it is a reflection of this toroidal pattern, we can free our minds from the perspective that anything is separate, even as a void of a black hole contains the existence of everything supposedly outside of it. This is reflected in the psychic nature of those who in meditation dive into the void of consciousness, and those also who reach a state of Godhead awareness that includes all life in unity and love. The one is all, and the all is one. In the Taurus, the point of singularity, whatever consciousness is present, is the purest representation of the whole. The whole field is emerging from and returning to its original source, and all of it is conscious, and the singularity at the center is the space where it all came together and emerged out of. This can be demonstrated with the understanding of how the heart emerges in the body. If you remember from lesson 15, the heart is the first organ to come into existence and the rest of the body folds out of the heart itself and then it pulls the heart into the center. The heart is truly more primal, more connected to source and far more important than the brain. The heart is the space of love and love of all is what will get you back into the heart and out of your brain. In order to grow and become lighter energetically, we as individuals and a society must learn to understand how to really get back into the natural flow of things. This is what the natural flow looks like, among a few other forms as well. For many, understanding the Taurus from a left brain perspective is needed to really get back in tune with yourself. For others, you already understand it intuitively, and you just have to go with the flow and everything will work out perfectly. According to the Mayans, the solstice on December 21st, 2012, precisely at 11.11 a.m. Universal Time, marks the completion of the 5,125 year great cycle of the Mayan long count calendar. 2012 also marks the completion of the 26,000 year procession of the equinoxes cycle, which we discussed in lesson five. According to the calendars, it also signifies the end of a 144,000 year cycle, a 78,000 year cycle, and a 26 million year cycle. The 2012 date marks the completion of this world age cycle, but it does not signify the end. Well, it kind of does. It's the end of what we know and into a transition of something new. It is a transitional state, but it definitely does not mean this. We need to understand that the 2012 prophecies are signaling to us to wake up and realize that these times on earth are very important. We are living in a landmark time in the history of this planet. We are collectively, as a species, approaching a crossroads that is calling out to us to participate in our fullest capacity. Let me show you a diagram to try and demonstrate just how important this is. First, this is how DNA works. See how you can basically map it out like a story? Here's the beginning, which could be seen as creation or start of a cycle. And then it moves outwards, expanding and moving into all potentials until it reaches its peak in the middle. It stretches far out and then begins moving back towards the center, back to its source. But it will be a new space that it now exists in. Then it returns back to a center point where it ends or transitions into a state where it expands out once more, continuing its infinite cycle of expansion and contraction. One could also say that it moves through the chakras, moving from a low frequency to an incredibly high frequency where it will unite and transition out once more. Now think of the human species like this and 2012 being that point of unity where everything comes together right before starting off again and expanding out into something new and different. This is basically what's happening right now on earth, but there's a catch. 
we have absolutely no idea how we're going to expand out because there are so many potentials with what's happening on the planet right now. Cycles are everywhere. The way in which we live our lives is made up of cycles. We have both biological cycles and technological cycles. Biological cycles exist naturally as a part of the creation process of life. And technological cycles are cycles that we have created and superimposed over top of these other cycles as a way of measuring and understanding the reality that we are a part of. Time is a perfect example of this. It doesn't really exist on its own. It has no life of its own. It's simply a measurement of some other cycles. So you could think of it as a measuring tool, such as an hour worth of this, or I'll meet you at six. In the past, we might have said it differently. Let's gather again at the second moon cycle. Let's get more into examples of technological cycles. Take, for example, our calendars, seconds, life cycles of video game consoles. Some of them, like our year-long calendar count, is our interpretation of a natural cycle, the Earth spiraling around the sun. Others, like video game consoles, are completely based on our modern world, current technology, the economy, buyer's demand, and what have you. Biological cycles are nature. They happen in relationship to each other and are much more harmonic than the cycles that we've created. They are natural. The tree doesn't think, hmm, is it time to bear fruit yet? I'm just not sure. I, I think I'll hold off because I'm afraid no one's gonna eat the fruit, right? In nature, the tree just doesn't. It knows by its inherent instructions what it's supposed to do. It's by its natural design. Other cycles in nature are like solar and lunar cycles, the four seasons, and bears that hibernate. Notice too, with the information from lesson 16, you could map it like this. There are smaller cycles within the larger cycles. Like our celestial cycle, we find it broken up into the four seasons. And inside that, we have the cycles of the rest of life on earth, all doing their thing in relationship with each other, which are both influenced by and influence the larger cycle. Sometimes it may not seem like the smaller cycles have no influence on the larger cycle, but just imagine the story of what happened to the Martians on Mars in the human history movie. I'm not saying that this is exactly what happened, but if the actions of the individual beings changed the evolution of the planet that ultimately ended up in the destruction of the planet, well, that would be the smaller cycles influencing the larger cycles. You know, it's just an idea. We also have cycles within our own bodies, such as breath, drinking water or liquids, and eating food. These cycles are a lot harder to map out because we are the ones who decide when we eat, what we eat, and how much we eat. But it actually does create effects on us throughout our days. Once again, those smaller cycles have an effect on our larger day-to-day -day cycles. Interesting, our interactions with the four elements are constantly cycling. Fire, for example, is prana, which is happening all the time, more frequently than breath, drink, and food. You can see how these cycles become more dense and happen less often. You breathe more than you eat. Air is less dense than solid food. And so it stands to reason that a dense cycle has a longer duration. As you breathe in, you ride the sine wave up. And as you breathe out, you drop the sine wave back down. As you go about your day, every hour, minute, and second, you are breathing. And if you created a healthy breathing cycle for yourself, then the other cycles you are experiencing, the larger cycles, would become more harmonic naturally. If you change the cycle of your breathing, if you alter it to accommodate technological cycles, such as pollution and obesity, then once again, the result is a cycle that is less harmonic with the natural order of things. Some call this dis-ease, the opposite of a natural cycle, which flows with ease. Of course, you can always correct a cycle that is in disease. Sure, it may take some time, but enough steps in the direction of a natural cycle do eventually get you back in the flow. If you start your day in a healthy way, at the start of the morning, then the rest of the day will flow that much more harmoniously. If you wake up with the sun, you ride the wave of the entire day and are more in tune with the day itself. This was a hard one for me to get and put into practice because I always used to love sleeping until noon. If you think about it, there are different things adapted for different parts of the day. Cats can see in the dark, so it makes sense that they're night animals. I have trouble seeing in the dark without superimposing a technological cycle over top of it. So maybe I should be sleeping. What I mean is lights and night goggles. Artificial light is a cycle of electricity, a technological cycle. There are positive and negative swings in the cycles. What I mean when I say positive and negative is the presence of something and the presence of the opposite of that thing. Such as with a magnet, you have a positive end and a negative end. 
one is pulling and one is pushing. Plus or minus, male and female. A lot of people think that negative means bad and positive means good, and that's not always the case. We're actually gonna to touch on that closer to the end of this video. A better way to look at it is male and female. Positive is male and negative is female. And don't get caught up on that positive is good and negative is bad. Women are wonderful. And in fact, in gender, everyone has both male and female energy, not just one or the other. It is the essence of giving and receiving. The best example I can give you is night and day. It's that simple. When we don't allow the cycles to flow in their natural order, we often create things that feel uncomfortable over and over. Sometimes we call it things we don't want. It's actually a sort of short circuit in the cycle or a loop. The positive looping back on itself or the negative looping back on itself. It's not supposed to be a loop. There needs to be a crossing over of the male and female energy. That's what creates the infinity, the oneness that we've all been feeling and talking about. Now, of course, we've also made the connection before between what we have described as cycles, this form and the structure of DNA. This is the instruction set for the building blocks that make up our being. As we increase our awareness of these instructions and understanding, we can transcend our 3D perspective of reality and shift into an awareness of the interconnected causality of all of the planes of existence. There's a little trick here though. Understanding and awareness are not necessarily the same thing. Just as the tree does what it does without needing to understand, without a brain, so to speak. Understanding is not required for the instructions to be followed. That simply means that sometimes the brain just gets in the way of the natural flow of the cycles, the natural knowing that comes through your heart. On that topic, I have something important to share. There's a lot of people who like to talk about life from this new age perspective that everything is just love and light all the time. And that if we just think happily, even when things aren't going very well, we'll be fine. In fact, I realize how I might've even propagated that idea in earlier lessons and flat out said it. Now, this idea isn't wrong. It is however, only half of the equation, half of the cycle. And if you recall, without the other half of the cycle, we have a loop. Think of it like a flowing river. If you cut off the flow, such as with a dam, it kills everything on one side by stopping the flow and everything dies of dehydration. And the other side becomes drowned in a loop which gets bigger and bigger until eventually it must break. And so, yes, we should strive to create a life for ourselves and each other that is filled with love, joy, and excitement. But when things aren't going very well, recognize if it's a part of the natural flow or if somewhere along the way you got caught in the loop. If we lie to ourselves and pretend that the loop is the flow, even when it's not, it limits our ability to create a real transmutation of it and create something new in its place, going with the flow. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me say it in a different way, just to make sure, because this is incredibly important. Sometimes things go well, and sometimes things go poorly. It's not always your fault, but you are always a factor in the cause and influence in the cycle. If you can account for the cycle, meaning take account of it, be aware of it, you can choose to actively respond or be responsible and have an able response to it. That's what being a creator is all about. I know I just said positive and negative are not good and bad. In this example, I'm going to use good and bad in place of positive and negative. By good and bad, I mean things that feel really good and things we do want and things that feel really bad and things we don't want. Just go with it. I know it might be a little confusing. Sometimes things feel really good and you're on the top of the wave. In this space, it's easy to ride the wave and feel good and be a creator. When you're on the bottom of the wave, if things are not excellent, sometimes it just feels easier to go to that fourth dimensional space and say, everything is perfect and in divine order. This is true from a 4D perspective. It is perfect and in divine order because it exists and is in this moment. And as it's manifesting in 3D, it is not excellent. It could be excellent, but it takes time, effort, and focused energy to transmute and change it into something that is excellent. What we need to practice is taking that positive flowing energy, and instead of looping itself back on itself, is flow with it through the negative energy in order to create a transmutation into what's next. When we say that things are perfect and in divine order and ignore the loops or even create them as a justification to dam up the river of good feelings, we actually inhibit the flow that leads to the next. That limits our ability to take action. And ultimately what we're left with is a poo sandwich. Here's the analogy. Say I'm making you a delicious sandwich 
and you've got bread, tomatoes, avocado, chives, maybe some peppers, and a roasted portobello mushroom. That is an excellent sandwich, right? Now, say I just put a big dollop of poo right on the top. Do you still want it? Can anyone honestly say that they would still want this sandwich? It's perfect and in divine order, right? Right, but it's certainly not excellent. And I don't care how delicious the other ingredients are. If there's poo on this sandwich, it's a poo sandwich. It doesn't matter how fresh the rest of the sandwich is, or even how fresh the poo is. It's not something we want to eat. The moral of this story is that if there's poop on your sandwich, if there's something in your life that is perfect but not excellent, don't just sit there and let it be. Find out what it is, why it is the way it is, and then take some actions to turn it into something you actually truly want. In that process, in that alchemy, we can really create some powerful change on this planet. If everyone could come from that space, we would see a new earth overnight. Because no matter how you slice it, McDonald's, landfills, oil rigs, and this entire way of life we've made for ourselves just doesn't work. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say that it could be something different, something magical, and more in harmony with ourselves and the world around us. Waste-free, flying vehicles, spirit centers, cloud cities, interstellar travel, and the infinity of possibilities that come along with it. It's all in the cycles. Check out this painting I found on DeviantArt by the brilliant artist Adrian Kenyon. This is his depiction of the miraculous conception of creation and human history. It starts at unity, a sphere. The caduceus is seen coming from it, duality, then a trinity. Then as the four elements come into manifestation, we get physical reality, crystals form, and water layers over top of it. All of these previous elements were conscious of their own, but now biological life begins to develop in the water and crawl onto land. We go through a few stages of evolution, dinosaurs, basic mammals, and then humans show up. There's a lot of ideas as to where we came from, and we won't get into this now. Adam and Eve happens, the Buddha becomes enlightened underneath the Bodhi tree, and then something shifts. From this point to here is where we are now. Disconnected from our own natural spiral, paving over the ground, killing people for telling us that being materialistic can heed nothing good. Then come the world wars, and the world falls into chaos. And then something shifts again. From the destroyed world, another seed grows. We switch into a different reality. It starts out small. From out of the chaos, a tiny new earth emerges and grows larger. This is the new earth, a new realm of light and purity that we were meant to be connected with all along. The planet continues to evolve. Here exist angels, archangels, and multidimensional hypercubes. The planet becomes more crystalline over time. The last part of the spiral is the seventh dimension and the realm of God, an infinite number of multiverses dividing like cells in an embryo, an ultimate omnipresence as everything that is contained in all of these multiverses is a part of God's consciousness. A snake biting its own tail, an Ouroboros, is the symbol of cyclic rebirth like the Phoenix. All of the information contained in the seventh dimension is held here like a nest for the next cosmic egg. There are a few other ideas that come to mind about this that I wanna share as well. First, look at the shape of it as a whole. It's the Trion Ray, the geometry of DNA and light that we've been looking at before. If you line that up with the chakras, you can see how we go from a super dense space up to the highest frequency until we once again connect with the same source that we were originally connected to. Doesn't that look familiar on the flower of life? If these theories about the flower of life are true, then that means this entire experience of human history and ascension and growth and evolution is just one wave of energy from one point to another on an infinite universe of possibilities. Each point is the supreme awareness of some aspect of the God Source consciousness field. And the energy that moves between it is the vibrations and waves of energy that we are experiencing called the electromagnetic field. As much smaller fractals of the same source energy have experiences through these waves. This image also doesn't account for the number of parallel realities that we could experience at this point. If the flower of life expands in these directions, then this is just one direction. Maybe instead of total destruction, which is what this image depicts, instead we make our first ET contact on this spiral and join our galactic family. On this wave, maybe something else happens. Like we start getting superpowers, like in Heroes or something. Maybe all of that can happen right here too. Now, regardless of all of the potentials we can come up with, let's bring it back to this diagram. Think about how this applies in your life. Every day you live could be seen as one mini spiral. However, seven small spirals make one larger one across the seven small ones. This is a week. 
Then several weeks create a month, several months create a year. You can map that over your life and see from birth to death, which is just like the Mayan calendar, not the end, but a transition into new level of life. This is such an exciting time for us. As mentioned earlier, we cannot know what is going to happen. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to be this or that, because I don't know either. We will change the outcome depending on our being. What's going to happen? You decide. In lesson one, we discussed how you create your own reality. Many people argued that it didn't make sense when others influence your life from out of the blue. What we didn't discuss, but probably should have, is that we are a collective. We are one species. You create your own reality, but we are all co-creating our realities together on a much broader scale. Think of an ant colony. Each individual ant decides where they want to go, what food they want to collect, and how they want to do it. But collectively, they are all working together to gather food for everyone and do what is necessary for the group, whether it be digging tunnels or gathering leaves. Humans are like that, except our mentality of do what's best for everyone is replaced with get enough money to survive, don't worry about the starving people on the street, help giant entities known as businesses take more money from the people, and don't question what's going on. We're doing it to ourselves, and we're doing it together. Together is the key word here. Together, we can break through barriers. Together, we can absolutely change the world, but we can only do it together, not individually. Individually, we can change our own individual world, which is where we need to start. When we learn that we can all get along with each other, regardless of race or belief or level of consciousness, we learn that absolutely anything is truly possible. But it has to start here, in your heart. There was a time when, through science, we believed that the cell was the smallest thing, the building block of life. New discoveries led to the realization that the cell wasn't in fact the smallest thing. Instead, the molecule was. Now the molecule was the fundamental building block of life. But then new discoveries revealed that it wasn't the molecule either. The molecules were made of atoms. Now the atom was the smallest thing that you could get. Then you guessed it. We discovered even smaller things. Now we have subatomic particles and they are the most fundamental building block of all reality. Oh, okay, hold on. Now scientists are throwing around something called string theory, which is like vibrating noodles in hyperspace, smaller than all of that other stuff. Okay, so maybe it does get smaller. It makes me smile. If there's anything we know for sure, it ought to be that there's always going to be something more or less as the case may be. With all of our mathematics, brilliant scientists, and ever-evolving understanding, we can look and look forever, but we won't be finding a bottom anytime soon. So why are we looking? What is science for? Is it just to know? Why does it even matter? Why should it matter to you? What difference does it make whether atoms or cells or vibrating noodles are the smallest thing? Perhaps it's because our level of understanding directly relates to the level of reality that we have control over which I suppose could be a very good thing. Or a very bad thing. Huh. We'll get into that a little later, because this video is about light. Why light? That seems pretty simple, doesn't it? It's what powers the earth. It's what powers me, you, everything around us. What if we could know the shape of light? It's most basic characteristics. It's smallest building blocks. What if we could understand the fundamental geometry and movement that light moved by? What if it was a three-dimensional solid form that we could map as simple as a tetrahedron or a cube? Would that change our understanding of reality? You know, I think that's what scientists and maybe all of us at some level are searching for. That one thing that might just allow us to create our own self-sustained ball of light. That one thing that connects everything. What if we could know that, the core building block of life and everything as we know it? Would it change our understanding of what light is? Well, let's put on our science hats and see what we can find out. Einstein said something amazing, something which has echoed through the halls of science since his death. He said that science should be simple, something that anyone can understand. Anyone can make things complicated and complex, but it takes a genius to make something simple. While doing research on Wikipedia, you find pages upon pages with bajillions of words describing these crazy formulas revealing the secrets of the universe, everything we know in modern science. Upon seeing these pages, it led me to ask a whole number of questions about what I was looking at. Questions like, why do we believe that light is what it is? What even is light? 
What is particle physics? Why is it relevant to me? Why is it that for the average Joe, these ideas about existence and reality are so hard to understand? Do scientists make them overly complex for a reason? Why are we having trouble following Einstein's brilliant words about simplicity? Is there a way that we can use sacred geometry to explain and simplify these ideas in a way that works and makes sense? And most importantly, how can I use this information in a way to grow as a person? I don't just want to build up beliefs about these topics. I want to expand my ability to create with them. And how do we do that? Where do we start? Well, let's start at the beginning. It's theorized across the board from creation myths, the basic geometry of the flower of life, and even in the Big Bang Theory, that light is among the first things created at the beginning of everything. So exploring and discovering how light works would be a fundamental piece to understanding everything. Let's take a look at particle physics and quantum physics. They may help us crack this code. Particle physics is the study of the basic building blocks of matter and the forces they exert on each other. In particle physics, scientists are trying to find the one, the one thing that creates everything else, or at least the phenomenon that they are observing. It is very closely related to quantum physics, which is using that same idea to discover the source of the universe we live in that ties everything together. Scientists in this field have done a lot of work in demonstrating and exploring the unified field theory, which shows that everything in the universe is connected through an infinite web of something. They're not sure what it is, but we can see how we are connected in a grand and mysterious way. As our sciences have looked smaller and smaller to find the smallest particle, we've reached a point where things get so small that we can no longer define what they look like. We try and define what particles are through abstract concepts and mathematics because we say that particles are unseeable and unknowable. And yet things are always going to get smaller and smaller. Everything is made of something else and it fractals down to infinity or it fractals larger to infinity. Some scientists have actually been known to cut infinite numbers when they find them because they're deliberately looking for finiteness instead of embracing the infinite nature of reality. Check out the movie Black Hole to see this happening in action. Particles are called particles because they're too small to be seen by instruments we have in science at this time. What that means is that we don't really know what particles even are. If we knew what they were, they would not be particles anymore. They would be described. There is kind of a broken dichotomy that is happening in this field. It's something that scientists all over the world are trying to figure out. Here's the problem. Light and other particles that move at the speed of light are assumed to have no mass. The speed of light, also known as the speed of massless particles, is about 299,792,458 meters per second. What we know in the field of science is that there's something that translates these particles from one side of the equation to the other, from the world of no mass and into the world of mass. If you ask the scientists this question, they would tell you that it's the Higgs field, the ever permeating field that gives things mass. In essence, light speed particles pass through the Higgs field and slow down and gain a property of mass. The popular Higgs boson is the particle that is created upon the light speed particle merging with the Higgs field. According to our formulas, this boson, this particle is supposed to come out with it. I think there's an important piece of information that we're missing here. And it starts with asking some questions. First of all, what even is mass? And second, why do we believe that light has no mass? On Wikipedia, mass is said to represent an amount of matter, but then it goes on to say that the term matter has no universally agreed upon definition. How can we say that light has no mass when we can't even agree upon a definition or understanding of what matter and subsequently mass even are? Because of all of our fancy equations as described earlier, we have kind of thrown all ideas about what light could actually look like out the window in favor of a complex equation that looks like this. I wanna take it back to simple. What if we could know the shape of light? What if we could actually define what the structure of light as well as every particle and thing in existence were? What if there was a basic geometry of the universe that we missed? Even more interesting, what if light was a geometric solid and there was no difference between the geometry of light and the simplest particle. What if mass and no mass was not just about the speed that it traveled, but also the density of the information held within the shape. 
Maybe the speed of the particle is interdependent upon the information that was carried in the form. And the more information it holds, the denser it becomes. I have a few examples to demonstrate what I'm talking about. The first is water vapor. I know that it's not a light speed particle, but perhaps they have the same properties. See, water has a heavy density, but when it heats up, it translates into vapor and rises into the air. It takes a 90 degree turn into another dimension of form and it merges together with itself to become clouds. As the clouds become packed, denser and denser, with so much information packed within them, eventually they have no choice but to release, and all of the water comes pouring down. It's changing from a high-speed particle into a denser one, based on the density of the information within the droplet, as well as the speed that it was traveling. Now, I recognize that this only partially works as an example, because the particles I was describing are not light-speed particles. But if we can take that idea and apply it to light, it seems to work in a very similar way. Let's think about photosynthesis. A burst of energy from the sun travels towards the earth as both a wave and a particle. It has properties of both, and it's moving at the speed of light and passes through a plant. That plant then absorbs the information and energy that it needed from the wave particle that passed through it. The plant then uses that information, the light speed particles that it took from the sunlight and uses it to create something with mass, merging them with water and other plant matter to create sugars and other nutrients. In addition to supporting the theory of light being a solid and holding information, and even mass, doesn't that also seem to fit the model of the Higgs boson too? I, I could be wrong, it's just an idea. If light is a solid, it can be both a wave and a particle simultaneously. If light is a solid, it can have both density or nothing inside it at all. And if light is a solid, well, what could it look like? What my friends and I have come up with is a combination of three forms, the three simplest shapes in existence. And as you look at it, ask yourself, can we simplify it further? Light is composed of two primary forces. We call these electricity and magnetism, thus electromagnetic waves and radiation. Electricity is particles and magnetism is waves. Remember everything we've talked about with male and female energy? Electricity is male, magnetics are female, curves and points, both of which are found on this shape. Looking at the flower of life, which is the blueprints for life and reality itself, you can see that's exactly how it works. You have male energy, the particles, the dots, and female energy, the waves, the curves. Now, you might notice inside the flower of life, there are two ways you can look at it. You can see the circles, lots and lots of circles that make up the whole image, this is the female perspective. You can also choose to see this, this little shape that looks like a seed, which makes up the entire picture from these seeds aligning themselves perfectly with each other in beautiful six-fold symmetry. This is the male perspective. This seed is called the Trion Ray, as coined by the man who founded Michael Evans. He is a man who has given a large part of his life to exploring sacred geometry and quantum physics. And quite honestly, his discoveries are evolutionary. The flower of life in two dimensions is a flat 2D representation of the way that the universe fits together in higher frequencies and higher dimensions. Michael saw this and asked a big question. If this is the universe from a 2D perspective, what would it look like in three? So he began modeling and molding three-dimensional flower of life together and discovered some pretty remarkable things. Everything has breath, everything breathes and everything lives. And so at a level of basic geometry of particle physics, we too must have breath. He found that every geometry we think we know of is a static and fixed perspective of what it really is. Tetrahedron? How about a tetrine and a tetrex? An inhale and an exhale of this basic form. Icosahedron? Here's an icosatrine and an icosatrex. He developed breathing models for all of the platonic solids. And then he found a new solid, one that hadn't been discovered before. Energy never travels in straight lines. It always moves in curves. By incorporating curves into the basic geometry of our platonic solids, you actually discover much simpler particles that before we never knew existed. And so we come back to these three images. The first one, as you know, is the sphere. This is simply one of the simplest forms and the most female. It's all curve. It's not hard to see how this form is used in the creation of all things. Just look at a planet or a star or even an egg. Next, we have this one, the Trinity or the Trion Ray. 
I'd actually like to make a distinction here. The Trinity is three spheres put together like a Vesca Pisces. And the Trion Ray is 1 16th of the volume of that. In three dimensions, they both come out with three edges, three faces, and two points, smaller than any other shape. It's a single shape that contains both particles and waves. They're both equally important, and Michael Evans proposes that with this Trion theory, he has speculated that light could in fact be a solid. In fact, it's highly likely. This Trion ray is the geometry of a straight line. For if you were to draw any of the platonic solids, you could replace all of the straight lines with a Trion ray, and you would get a diagram of both the inhale and the exhale of that platonic solid. The great artist Delacroix once said, it would be worthy to investigate whether straight lines exist only in our brains. The interesting thing about the Trion ray and the Vesca Pisces is that they both have straight lines as well as curves and it's just a matter of perspective. One of the most important pieces of information about all of these shapes though, is that this is how form comes into manifestation from a geometric perspective, from source to the material world. The sphere is a ball, it's all curve. Upon adding a second sphere, you get the first edge. And so this is curves and edges. When you add the third sphere, you get the first points. And now you have curves, edges, and points all together in one shape. As you continue adding circles, you get more and more shapes and forms that begin to manifest, such as the platonic solids and, and everything else we know about. This is why the Vesica Pisces is so important. As you know, we've been looking at this for a long time and we're going to continue to. Over the past year, I've been learning that the Vesica Pisces is one of the most important keys for waking up and transformation on this planet. It is a model for bringing people together to create powerful change on this planet. As we grow together and make powerful connections with each other, it is our connections that begin to alter the way that we do things. We help each other refine our messages. It is asking each other questions that allows us to explore deeper into what something really means. And then with the newfound information that we gathered together, we can set off on a journey to change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, these three forms are what I believe to be the God particles. We have a male form, a female form, and a form of a merging together of both of them. The God particle is not a matter of scale. It is not a smallest thing like a Lego block, but rather the simplest geometry that we can conceive in this dimension. It is a geometry that makes up all manner of things, regardless of size and scale. Just look around you. Most seeds look like this. Most leaves look like this. Most fruits look like this. Eggs look like this. Sperm looks like this. It's practically impossible not to find examples of it everywhere. All we need to do is take a look. Okay, grand finale. To answer that big question from the beginning, how does the infinite universe have a beginning? I have a feeling you might already know. It's a cycle. And no, I don't know exactly what it looks like specifically, but I can share with you some ideas about it. Every cycle comes to an end and then begins a new cycle. Or maybe it's the old one continuing on again. Some theories about the universe say that once it was a hugely expanded thing and it contracted to a small point, a space of unity, and then rapidly expanded outwards again. And today, while we can't see the remnants of the previous universe, at least not yet, we can see the beginning of this cycle that we are a part of. It's really interesting. If the universe is infinite, how is it that we're existing in a finite space? And is the goal of life to take what is finite and merge it with the infinite to create a new way of life and a new understanding of ourselves? Of hope. Each of our souls. 